Muhammad Hail, uh, the time is yours. All right, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Very clear. All right, so uh, Assalamualaikum and a very good afternoon. Um, I am Hana Yuzati from University of Trump, Malaysia and thank you to the committee and all the members. All right, so next. Okay. Next. All right, so GDM, or uh, gestational diabetes mellitus, is defined as any degree of glucose intolerance with onset of first recognition during pregnancy. And it is one of the most common pregnancy complications uh, according to the ADA. And a previous study has reported that the pooled global standardized prevalence of GDM was 14% with the highest prevalence was reported in the Middle East and North um, Africa and Southeast Asia. And a little bit on the clinical pathophysiology of GDM. So what happened is that during pregnancy, placental hormones comprising of human placental lactogen, um, estrogen, prolactin, cortisol, and growth hormone produces an insulin-resistant environment by stimulating a decrease in the phosphorylation of insulin receptor, and this leads to an increase in the blood glucose level. Um, next. All right, so the prevalence of GDM has been increasing, and according to the World Health Organization, WHO, it is estimated to contribute to about 30% of T2DM cases worldwide. And GDM, um, as we know, poses significant health effects to both the mother and the fetus. So studies have shown that women with a history of GDM were seven times more likely to develop T2DM compared to those with um, normal glucose status, and this will this increasing GDM prevalence will likely affect the increase of future progression to type 2 diabetes. Next. All right. And in the past three decades, the prevalence of T2DM has risen dramatically in countries of all income levels, in which according, um, according to the International Diabetes Federation, um, in 2014, about 422 million people worldwide have diabetes, which have then increases to about 463 million people in 2019. So there is a globally agreed target to halt the rise in diabetes by 2025, as it is expected to increase to about 700 million worldwide. And in Malaysia, um, according to the National Health and Mobility Survey, the prevalence um, by the Ministry of Health, the prevalence rate of diabetes in adults has increased from 11.2% in 2011 to 18.3% in 2019, in which one in five adults have diabetes, and the majority of 57.1% of these patients were females. Next. All right, so diet of food, which is very much close to us, plays a very important role and is one of the cornerstones or foundations of diabetes care and management in which MNT or medical nutrition therapy is actually the principal intervention component with the objective to keep blood glucose levels within the normal range by standardizing dietary management while also taking into account the importance of an individualized um, nutrition approach and to provide recommendations, which is based on um, evidence-based medicine. However, poor dietary management often impedes the management strategies, for instance, um, due to poor adherence with lifestyle recommendations and also dietary modifications. Okay, so dietary intake among women when this population with a history of GDM is limited and uncertain in terms of what are actually their characteristics of their diet post-delivery. And it is important to understand their dietary intake as this can help in the development and promotion of educational strategies, which is particularly important in order to establish an early measure in reducing the complications of GDM. Therefore, next. The objective of the study is to determine the dietary intake of women among uh, with a history of CDM. Next. All right, so moving on, this study was conducted at the Maternal and, and Child Health Clinic Street Mangan in Selangor and the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences um, Selangor and ethical approval was granted by the National Medical Research Registry and MIR and also the Ethics Committee for Research Involving Human Subjects, JKUPM. Next. Okay, dietary intake was assessed with a three-day, 24-hour dietary recall on non-consecutive days, which were on two weekdays and one weekend, in which um, respondents or the women were asked about the food and beverages consumed in the past 24 hours, 
and this includes the meal time, cooking method, and also quantity or portion size of the food. And then some anthropometry measurements were taken, including high weight, weight circumference, and also BMI was calculated and classified according to the um, groups. Next. All right, so moving on, the inclusion criteria were Malaysian women aged 18 to 49 years old and have a history of GDM. And those excluded were pregnant women, recently hospitalized within six weeks, have presence of reported or previously diagnosed medical conditions and are receiving drugs such as um, glucose lowering drugs. And screening form was used to identify um, eligible respondents and women who fit the criteria were then provided with information sheet um, to explain the purpose of the study and consent form were then obtained before data collection took place. All right, next. Okay, so moving on into results. So um, looking into the characteristics of these women with a history of GDM. So a majority of the women in this study were in the age categories of more than 25 years old and with the majority of them being of Malay ethnicity and having tertiary education. And in this study, tertiary education is categorized as a level of education which is pursued beyond high school, including undergraduate and graduate credentials. And the mean age in this study is 34 years, which is comparable to a study in the United States among women with recent GDM pregnancy, which reported the mean age of about 33 years. Um, on the other hand, the reported mean age in this study was a bit higher compared to several studies in local Malaysia among women with a history of GDM, which reported a mean age um, ranging from 28 to 31 years old. And it is well established that aging is associated with um, decline in physiological function, which leads to chronic diseases, including diabetes, as the ability to regulate glucose levels um, progressively decreases with age. And the mean household income was um, 6,667 ringgit, in which half of them were being among the M40 category, according to the income classifications in Malaysia, um, based on the household income and basic amenities survey report, which um, provided by the Department of Statistics. So if I may share, the terms B40, M40, and T20 actually refers to the household income classifications in Malaysia, in which um, B40 represents the bottom 40%, M40 represents the middle 40%, whereas T20 represents the top 20% of Malaysian household income. And apart from educational level, previous studies have from both developing and developed countries have reported that inverse associations between diabetes and household socioeconomic status um, was reported. And in terms of smoking status, um, on, only one respondent had a history of smoking, which is, which, in which she was a former smoker, and none of the respondents were um, smoking during, um, in this, during the recruitment of this study. Next. Moving on into the characteristics of these women with a history of GDM. So um, the mean BMI of these women was 26.5 kilogram per meter squared, in which half of the women in this study, or 58%, were either overweight or obese. And based on the National uh, NHMS 2019, one in two adults in Malaysia were either overweight or obese. And this was found to be the highest among females. And also a majority of them or 73.9% of them had waist circumference of um, 80 centimeter or above, reflecting a trend of general Malaysian population in which one in two adults in Malaysia had abdominal obesity, which is defined as um, this criteria um, cut off and also found to be the highest among females. Next. All right, so this finding is um, alarming as major diseases have associated with overweight or obesity and abdominal obesity includes diabetes, high, high blood pressure, and also heart disease. And furthermore, the increased prevalence of overweight and obesity has also accompanied the rise in T2DM in Malaysia. Next. All right, so moving on into the dietary intake of these women in this study. So the percent contribution of macronutrients to its total daily energy intake is based on the recommended nutrient intakes for Malaysia RNI. And the mean carbohydrate, protein, and sugar intakes are within the recommended level. However, on the other hand, fat intake next exceeded the recommended intake for adults, which was re um, restricted to a conservative range of 25 to 30% of total energy intake. 
and intakes of fiber, iron, and calcium were inadequate or did not meet the RNI. Next. Okay, so the RNI actually recommends 20 to 30 gram of consumption of daily fiber. And um, to add on, this is um, accompanied by the recommendation of the Malaysian healthy plate by filling the first quarter of the plate with the whole grains and the other half with vegetables and fruits, or also better known as the suku suku sparrow um, pinggan method. And why is this important? Because apart from digestive health, dietary fiber actually plays a crucial role in the overall health and well being. And the iron intake did not meet the recommended intake according to the um, RNI, reflecting a trend of a general Malaysian population in which reported that one in five Malaysians were anemic. So um, similarly, the NHMS reported that among women of reproductive age group of 18 to 49 years old, it was found that three in 10 of them were found to be anemic. And therefore, the RNI actually recommended um, several prior areas of research which includes periodic assessment of the iron status of these vulnerable groups and also intervention studies. Next. All right, so in conclusion, dietary intake among women with um, this population with the history of GDM reported herein is not optimal and may therefore set out as a guide in determining the ideal diet for this population in order for early preventive measures to be delivered. And determination of dietary intake among this population actually demonstrates the importance of enhancement in efforts to increase the screening rates and follow up after delivery. Um, why is this important? Because postpartum glucose intolerance has been reported among women with a history of GDM as one of the health consequences following pregnancy complicated with GDM. So in short, this highlights the importance of providing educational strategies to increase the patient's acknowledgement of this topic, particularly on diabetes risk. Um, early education on the relationship of dietary intake and future diabetes risk. And this could be initiated during pregnancy in these high-risk individuals. So that is all from me. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Miss, Miss Hana Izzati, right? Yep. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Miss Hana Izzati, for your very nice presentation. Uh, what time in Selangor now? Um, it's one hour, it's 12.42 p.m. now. 12 and 42 p.m. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Ms. Anaisati, I am interested to your uh, presentation and your study. Uh, but uh, I will ask about the, the exercise because some people uh, uh, may be doing uh, or consume the same diet or maybe consume the, the uh, equivalent diet. But... Mm -hmm. uh, the one people is uh, doing more exercise than the other people. Do you consider in your uh, research to uh, to consider the exercise or the the, the sport for uh, the, the the woman that uh, doing exercise more now the people? Yeah, sure. Um, actually, uh, in this study, we actually and um, also analyze and get the information on the physical activity level based on the IPAC questionnaire. But it is not included in here. But if I may share, um, actually most of them were inactive, and I believe this is due to the fact that um, most of them and some of them were actually still in their post delivery. Um, within especially most of them were about six weeks postpartum, so I guess they didn't really um, are not in the phase so um, of physical high physical activity level as of yet. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Mariwati, do you have any questions or another okay. participants? Okay. I okay, have uh, one. Eh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Abu Bakar. Hana Izzati. Thank you. Welcome to Indonesia. For this <laughs> yeah. Thank you. You very fast to speak in English. Wow. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, this Study, this your study, uh, your team exclude the woman pregnant. Mm -hmm. Can you explain con uh, consideration why the exclusion criteria of pregnant woman? Okay, why because... pregnancy? Yes, while pregnancy is natural, the woman must go to throat. Hmm. Okay. Thank you, Mr. All right. Mata. All right, thank you for the question. Okay, so actually because this study actually is among the women to, to 
view their characteristics positively. So as because the ones that are currently pregnant may have different diet and different requirements. So we wanted to see how does their um, dietary characteristics post delivery? Is there any change? Because previous studies have also um, investigated into the dietary intake during um, pregnancy. So we wanted to see is there any difference comparing to um, those population during pregnancy? Uh, can uh, the study to the implementation if the uh, the woman is an um, on pregnant? Sorry, I. Huh? I did the study prob probability the study to implementation of the on the uh, pregnant implementation on on pregnancy woman on pregnancy the study implementation the probability. Maybe. I believe so, but then uh, they there may be different because different requirements uh, dietary require, there are there are different dietary requirements for those pregnant women compared to the normal uh, population. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank All you, right. Hana. Is Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Merwati and Miss Hana. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions for Miss Hana? Okay, if now we go to the next uh, presenter, but we give the applause to Ms. Hana first for uh, her very nice uh, presentations. Okay, uh, 